Shabbat Shalom, everybody. It's so great to have all of you here. I know it's a, a little shy New Year's Eve weekend. I'm sure everyone is having fun. Uh, but as you know, here at El Shaddai Ministries, we want every one of you to be the light. We're all light. Every single one of us. We all have, may have different um, magnitude of light. <laughs> but in Malachi, I think it's in, oh no, it's in Daniel. It talks about... Uh, the righteous will shine like the stars. That's what it says. And as we know, there's all different size stars. Uh, but uh, the main thing is when all of us come together, we're one big massive star, one big massive light. And that's really what it is all about. There's a video that I just saw that I'll probably play next week. But what's amazing, uh, if you've been to Israel, they have some of these um, ancient stadiums Okay, especially in Caesarea, and that might even be where this was. Uh, but anyway, there was over a thousand Jews from, you know, every denomination of Judaism or whatever, and the left and the right. But they all came together in this arena thing outside. They were all musicians, and they all sang with one voice about letting the people come home that are, were kidnapped. And I couldn't help but think of how you have all these different musicians. I mean, they had like 20 drummers and 30 violins and I mean, just everything imaginable. And they're all singing in one accord. And I can't help but think of that's when the glory fell. The glory fell, uh, you know, it says every time when they were with one voice. And to see all the Jews coming together with one voice singing praises, I can't help but think the Messiah is on his way. But uh, as I say, here at LCI Ministries, our goal has always been to take the Torah to the nations because the Torah is the light. We are not the light. We're just, I always see ourselves like a mirror. Uh, that's all we are. We're a mirror and God's light shines on us, not for us, but for us to reflect that light back into the world. Uh, we're the mirror basically, but sometimes we have to clean our mirror. <laughs> Every time I clean my glasses, you know, uh, I'm thinking, hmm, yes, yeah, so we got to clean our glasses. We got to clean our mirror so that our light will shine brighter than ever before. Let's see. Very excited about the Torah portion today. Vaya Kai, which means, and he lived. Well, let's begin um, with Jacob. It says in Genesis 46, 27, all the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were how many? Three score and 10, that is 70. That's 60, scores 20. Oh, now, here's one thing. How would you like to be Jacob? When you think about, I mean, all of us have had tragic lives in different ways, but as far as Jacob goes, his dad preferred his twin brother Esau. His twin Esau was out to kill him. Uh, he has to run for his life to another country. His uncle Laban deceives him, takes advantage of him. His beloved wife Rachel has died. His oldest son Reuben defiles his wife. And the next two sons, Simeon and Levi, murdered all the inhabitants of Shechem. And then the next one, Judah, ran off marrying a Canaanite. And then Judah's wife and his two sons dies. And then his son Joseph has also been torn apart by a beast. He's had some trauma. You know, this reminds me of something I wanted to put in my notes that I forgot to mention. So I'll just... Well, look at Acts 7, 14. Okay, it says, then sent, now this is in the New Testament, then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, 75. Wait a minute. How in the world can the Torah say 70 and the book of Acts says 75 was one of them wrong? No, they're both correct. The problem is you're not detailing the verses. When it says in Genesis 46, 27, <clears throat> the souls of the house of Jacob, that means his descendants. None of the wives of the tribes are mentioned. And they went in. In Acts, it says, uh, it says, then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all of his kindred, and there are 75 souls. Well, the wives of the tribes weren't mentioned because they weren't a descendant of Jacob. 
That's why they're not mentioned in Genesis because it was specifically the house of Jacob. Here it says all the kindred, which means there were probably five wives of one of the five tribes that are still there. Does that make sense? This is how you always have to look at when two verses seem to contradict. The problem is with you, not the scriptures. You have to kind of detail, find out why. There's always something hidden in things like that. But uh, let me see. Not only that, Jacob wasn't mentioned in the descendants of Jacob. So right there gives you 71 because the original just has his descendants, not Jacob himself. Not only that, Dinah may have had a husband, okay, or Dina. Uh, so anyway, the, the youngest brothers were like, you know, in their 40s or something like that. So they all could have had a wife that weren't mentioned. But anyway, so that's why. Okay, now, let me see if I want to bring this in. Okay, let's look at Deuteronomy 25, verse 5 and 6. I want to set you up for this. If brethren dwell together and one of them dies, okay, you have two brothers, okay, and one of them dies, and he doesn't have any kids, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger, her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. Okay, does everyone follow that? That's only if she doesn't have a kid. Okay, now it says, and it'll be that the firstborn which he bears shall succeed in the name of his brother, which is dead, that his name not be put out of Israel. Okay, this is gonna be so mind-blowing for you guys and for a lot of the Jewish people because they uh, misunderstand this verse as well. But let me show you something right here. Okay, we know from the scriptures that Terah had two wives. We don't know their name, but we know he had two wives. And wife number one and Terah produced Abraham, Haran, and Nahor. Everyone knows that, right? Okay, Haran had two wives, believe it or not, and I'm going to prove that to you. But here's what's interesting. Genesis 20, verse 12. Abraham told everyone that Sarah was his sister, and now he get called on it. And he says, and yet indeed, she is my sister. She's the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. So notice this. Here's Sarah, but Sarah is the half-sister to all three of these guys. You following me? Sarah is from Terah, it says. You following me? Okay, and the other wife. That's why this happens. Now, watch as this unfolds. Haran dies. Okay, so now they're, he's got two wives, and they're, how are we going to do this? What happens? Well, we know that Haran and wife one produced Milka, Iska, and Lot. Genesis eleven twenty seven b Haran beget Lot. Genesis eleven twenty nine b in the name of Nahor's wife, because he ends up marrying the father of Milka and the father of Iska. So we have all three of them. And Haran is the father, and they all came through this one. And so what happens, Haran and Nahor get together, right? Everyone following me? Now, because Lot goes with Abraham, right? Milcah goes with Nahor, right? But I have two questions. Okay, first off, Haran's wife didn't die. Why doesn't he marry his wife? Well, that rule is only if she has no children. So he decides he's going to marry Milka. Now, the Jewish people say, Iska is Sarah. And I say that is absolutely impossible because it says Haran beget Iska and Terah beget Sarah. How can the daughter of Haran also be the daughter of Terah? It cannot be. 
What happened? Okay. I believe wife one is probably dead. Okay. And that's why he marries Milka, but he wasn't required to marry that wife. But look at this. Genesis 1130 says, but Sarah was barren and she had no child. Now, what does she have to do? Why did Abraham marry Sarah and not Iska? Okay, here's what's going on. I believe Sarah was Haran's second wife and she was barren. And this is why Abraham married Sarah. Abraham is her uh, half brother, but so was Haran her half brother. But if Sarah was married to Haran, he'd be obligated because she's the wife who's barren. Isn't that interesting? Because there's no obligation for Abraham to marry Sarah. She's his half sister. And if she was married to Haran first, he'd probably feel obligated to. And so I believe what's fascinating so Abraham marries Sarah because I believe she was Haran's other wife and she was always barren. But the reason why is Hashem kept Sarah barren from Haran and Pharaoh and Abimelech. All through the stories, he's keeping her for Isaac. Iska cannot be Sarah. But anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. Okay, so now let's go to Genesis 47, 27. It says, and Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein, and they grew, and they multiplied exceedingly. We know the land of Goshen is a place of miracles, and they are multiplying like crazy, all right? Uh, they have a multiplication of children. They're coming from everywhere. Look at Exodus 8.22. God says, I'm going to sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies will be there. To the end, you may know that I am the Lord in the middle of the earth. One of the main things, we'll look at this more when we get into Exodus, but Pharaoh was challenging whether God even exists. Then he was uh, challenging whether he got involved with human affairs because he's whipped there in heaven. What does he have to do with human? He doesn't care about humanity. And then the third thing is, and if he does, is he more powerful than me? So those are the three things that Pharaoh was questioning. And so God uh, gives him the answers that you'll see when we go to the book of Exodus. But now, what do we see here? There was no swarms of flies. Can you imagine if it's dark everywhere, but you have daylight? There's frogs everywhere, but you have no frogs. All the cattle are dying everywhere but yours. After a while, it becomes, this has to be a God thing. It can't be a coincidence. Uh, as a matter of fact, look at Exodus 9, 26. It was only in the land of Goshen where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. Exodus 10, 22 and 23. Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky. There was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three whole days. They didn't see one another. Neither did anyone get out of his place for three whole days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Uh, to me, this is God so showing he's in the middle of the earth, creating a separation between his people and the rest of the world. But now to our Torah portion, where it begins. It says, Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life was 147 years. Okay, that's why it says, and he lived, Vayakai. Jacob lived for 147 years. Now, in verse 29 and 30, it says, When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph, and he said to him, If now I found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. You know, that, that's kind of interesting. If I'm on my deathbed, I don't care what they do with me. <laughs> you know, I would think, hey, I'm out of here, you know. But he said, I want you to deal kindly with me. Don't bury me in Egypt, he says. But... Let me go be buried with my fathers. Get me out of here and bury me in their burying place. And Joseph says, okay, I'll do as you have said. And then in Genesis 48, 1, it came to pass after these things that someone told Joseph, hey, your father's sick. And so what does Joseph do? He takes with him his two sons, Manasseh 
and Ephraim. And they're, when you see a lot of the paintings of them, they're like eight and nine years old. It's more like 28 and 29 when this happens. And <clears throat> listen to what this says in verse three and four. Jacob speaks to Joseph first. And he said, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan. And he blessed me. And he said to me, behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you. And I will make you into a multitude of people. Well, that's what happened during the whole time they were in Egypt. He says, I'm going to give uh, this land to your seed after you for an everlasting possession. Wow. And so what happens in Genesis 48, 15 and 16? He blessed Joseph and he said, the God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day. I want to mention something right here. God is known to Israel first as a shepherd long before he's known as the king. This is powerful. In Genesis, long before the Exodus, when all the laws come, he wants all of Israel to know, look, I'm your dad. I'm your shepherd. I'm the one who cares for you. And I think that's a very important foundation that we need to realize. And then he says, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless these boys and in them, let my name be carried on and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And then it says, let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Wow. I think it's interesting that Israel or Jacob wants his name to be carried on and that they may grow into a multitude. Well, look at Genesis 48, 19. Here, Joseph wants him to switch his hands over Ephraim and Manasseh and his fathers refused. And he said, I know it, my son, I know it. Now he can't see. How do you think he knew which was which? Well, it says he embraced them. And I'm sure he embraced them. He wanted to see who was taller so he would know which one from when he did see him. Okay, so uh, he knows how he fooled his dad and he's gonna make sure that doesn't happen to him. And so he embraces them and he's trying to figure out which is which and where they're standing since he can't see real well. And then he says, uh, but truly his younger brother Ephraim shall be greater than him and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Now, the Hebrew word for nations is goy or goyim. You may have heard that term before. And the word uh, multitude is melo, and it means the fullness. So this means the fullness of the Gentiles. Wow, isn't that in Romans? We hear about the fullness of the Gentiles. And Romans is referring to this very verse. This is the one he's talking about. Now, uh, what's uh, interesting is uh, next week's Torah portion, we begin the book of Exodus, and it starts in Exodus 1-7. The people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Okay, it wasn't just adding, it was multiplying. They say back then they were having triplets and quadruplets and quintuplets. I mean, they were just having kids like crazy. But the, the Hebrew word there to grow is daga. Now, what does dog, not D-O-G, uh, D-A-G, dog mean in Hebrew? Fish. So they're multiplying like fish. We, nowadays, we'd say rabbits, but uh, back then it was fish. Fish were just, they were multiplying. And the amazing thing is you don't notice fish are multiplying when they're underwater. It's only when they're all of a sudden out of the water. Uh, and so I think that's one thing. God kind of hid them in Goshen almost, and they're multiplying and multiplying. And Egypt didn't even realize it until it comes to the point when it's time for them to the Exodus that all of a sudden they say, oh my goodness, you know, they're multiplying like fish. Um, and fish are more protected being unseen by man. And so they grew unnoticed. Uh, and the other thing, uh, let me see. Oh, well, let's look at Matthew 4, 18 and 19. Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he saw these two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said to them, follow me, I will make you what? Fishers of men. So all of that concept goes back to this. They're growing like fish, but the problem is where? That water represents the nations, and these fish are in the water. 
a mixed multitude. So God wants to save Israel by pulling them out of the nations, the water, and bring them to the land of Israel. Do you see the concept here? Okay, to be saved, they've got to be out of the nations. They've got to be a separate people. Now, this is going to be heavy as we go. Could they be saved? Uh, let's say, now see the problem with the word saved being something different to everybody. Uh, like saved means uh, saved from a tornado. Okay, I want to use saved like the word saved from a tornado or something. Okay, if you're saved from a tornado, you either went through the tornado and weren't protected, but it's better to drive far away so you don't have to worry about the tornado. Okay, so here, could they have been saved if they stayed in Egypt? Think of it that way. They had to cross the Red Sea in order to be redeemed. You following me? They couldn't have stayed in Egypt. <laughs> this is going to be heavy. Uh, here, let me just look at something. I want to make sure. Okay. Okay, here we go. All right. Now, uh, in Ezekiel, look at Ezekiel 47, 8 through 10. God is speaking to Ezekiel, and he said to me, these waters issue toward the east country. That means going from Jerusalem or toward China that way, if you're there, okay, or to the Dead Sea. And it says they go down into the desert and go into the Dead Sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters will be what? Healed. And it will come to pass that everything that lives and moves wherever the river shall come shall live. And there will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters will come there for they will be healed. Everything shall live where the river comes and it'll come to pass that the fishers shall stand on it from En Gedi, even to En Aglaim, and they shall be a place to spread forth their nets. Their fish will be according to their kinds as the fish of the great sea exceeding many. We know there's a lot of different types of fish. Well, guess what? There's a lot of different types of believers. A lot of different types. We can't make, you can't make a poodle into a German shepherd. Or you can't make a Great Dane into a Chihuahua. All right? But they're all dogs. And that's what we have to understand. God wants both unity and diversity. He wants both. The world wants everyone to be sane. Everyone has to be woke. Everyone has to be whatever. And, you know, they want this one world government. See, the, the problem with the Tower of Babel and unity, their idea of unity is everyone has to be exactly the same. Okay, God builds with stones. We're living stones, and every stone is a different shape and size and weight. And so we have to realize we have to have both unity and diversity or something's wrong. Okay, and then look at Ezekiel 47, 12. And by the river on the bank, on this side and on that side, will grow all kinds of trees for food whose leaf will not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It will bring forth new fruit according to his months because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary and the fruit thereof shall be for food and the leaf for medicine. Well, you know what that's talking about? That's talking about the book of Revelation. Look at 22, one and two. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the lamb in the middle of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bore 12 manner of fruits, yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. That's the most amazing verse to be connected so we understand what is Ezekiel talking about. And then what happens, Israel, he beheld Joseph's sons, and he said, who are these? And Joseph said to his father, well, these are my sons whom God has given me here. And he said, please bring them to me and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel was dim for eight so that he couldn't see. He brought them near to him and he kissed them. And what else did he do? He embraced them. Why is he embracing them? He's trying to figure out which is which. Okay. So the big thing is 
what Israel said, who's partially blind or mostly blind, is who are these? Think about that. Who are these? Watch what happens. In Romans eleven twenty five, he says, the apostle Paul says, I would not, brothers, that you would be ignorant of a mystery, lest you would be wise in your own conceits that blindness only in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Okay? This goes right back to Genesis when he blessed them saying, be like Melo Goyim, the fullness of the Gentiles. Well, fullness doesn't mean quantity. You don't harvest a crop when it's not ready. You have to wait until it's mature. So the fullness of the Gentiles doesn't mean God's waiting until the last Gentile that's going to be saved comes in. He's waiting for the Gentile church to grow up. He's waiting for the Gentile church to mature. He don't want to marry a child bride. And so for all of the body, both Jews and Gentiles, God is waiting for the church to grow up. Now, Isaiah 49, verse 18 through 22. Look what Isaiah says. Lift up your eyes round about and behold, all these gather themselves together and are coming to you as I live, says Jehovah. You shall surely clothe you with them all as with an ornament and gird yourself with them. What? Like a bride. What's going on? Here, Israel is the bride, but then all of the nations are coming around her, supporting her, and the whole body, Jew and Gentile, becomes the bride. It's right here. For as for your waste and your desolate places, your land that has been destroyed, surely now shall uh, you be too straight for the inhabitants. They that swallowed you up shall be far away. The children of your bereavement shall yet say in your ears, the place is too straight for me. Give me a place to me that I may dwell. And then you're going to say in your heart, who are these? Who are all these kids? Okay. And it says, seeing I have been bereaved of my children, I am solitary and exile, wandering to and fro. And who hath brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. These, where were they? Thus says the Lord Jehovah, behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations, set up my ensign to the people, and they're going to bring your sons in their bosom and your daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. When God said he's going to lift up his hand to the nations, what are they going to see? The nations, they're going to see the pierced hand. Not only that, he says, I've engraven Jerusalem on the palms of my hands. So the nations are going to realize that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is lifting up his hand and he's telling them to bring his kids. Now, I don't have this in here, but this is so mind-blowing. It says in Jeremiah chapter 16, right around verse 16, that there's going to be a second exodus that will out eclipse the first exodus. The first exodus, you had you know, a couple million people in a matter of a days leaving Egypt. I believe persecution is coming that is going to be so bad and I, in every nation against the Jewish people. Right now, a lot of them are already fleeing France, Germany. I believe prophetically there is going to be a mass exodus like we've never seen before with Jews from every nation going to Jerusalem. It's a pattern of what happened back then and what's going to happen now. But there's going to be flights and flights and flights. It's going to get to the point where Jews do not feel safe anywhere but Israel. Uh, and that's a prophecy that hasn't been fulfilled yet. Because in Jeremiah 16, it says, I will bring you not just from Egypt, but I'll bring you from every nation where you've been scattered. And it's got to be bigger than the original Exodus. Okay? He says there no more will say, wow, these are the people that came out of Egypt. But no, these are the people that came from every nation. So I believe prophetically that is coming. Okay, so again, the big question is, through this verse in Genesis, is who are these? Well, I believe Jacob or Israel is going to ask the same question again in these last days. Who are all of these? Where have they come from? These are the believers who support Israel. Like I said, Ruth versus Orpah. This is the pro-Israel. People are coming from all the nations of the earth in order to be united with the people of Israel. In the last days, 
Yeshua is drawing near to Israel with the children that have been born again among the Gentiles. Just like Joseph is a type of Yeshua, Yeshua is going to bring his sons and daughters. Just like Joseph did. And Israel's going to say, who are all these? Oh my gosh, they are part of us, part of the family, just like Ephraim and Manasseh was. Um, they're going to come from every nation, tribe, people, and language to be completely united with the people of Israel. And so Israel as a nation is going to ask the same question. Where? I didn't know they were Jews, or I didn't know they were part of our family, or I, you know, I didn't know what. And uh, the, the important thing is they're not going to believe their eyes that there's so many people, part of their family, that are coming from the nations. Just like Ephraim and Manasseh, we're not to be considered strangers and foreigners to Israel, but they're grafted into the family. Now, Israel said, Joseph, I'm sorry, but they are no longer your sons. They're my sons. So they took the same place as the rest of the family. Anyone you have have after this, they can be your kids, but these two kids are no longer my grandsons. They're my sons and daughters. You know, that is pretty mind blowing. Now, when Ephraim and Manasseh became part of Israel, did all the rest of them no longer be Israel? Okay, so we have to understand when we go in, we're grafted into Israel, it doesn't mean we've replaced Israel. That's the problem with replacement theology. We think, oh, because we've been grafted in, all the rest of them are worthless. Or God doesn't care about them. No, you're adopted. (laughs) You don't replace the original tree. That's how this needs to be understood. Okay, look at Ephesians 2.19. What does Paul say? Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, your fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And so it's so important that we realize that you don't have to originally be Jew or from a tribe of Israel because you're going to be accepted in any way as family members. That's so important. Isaiah 49, 5 and 6. And now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him. Okay, now wait a minute. Who's me here? Who's me here that's going to bring Jacob? See, in Isaiah 53, a lot of Israel says that uh, Isaiah 53, who suffers is Israel. It's not the Messiah. But that's impossible. Jacob can't atone for itself and all of its sins. And it's the same thing here to bring Jacob back to him. How can Jacob bring himself back? He can't. He's in bondage in Egypt. And so what do we see? This is referring to the Messiah. And it says that God formed him from the womb. That kind of shows you God is involved in the womb when Yeshua is born. And he is to be a servant to bring Jacob back. Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So here we see there's a servant who's got not only going to bring Israel back to the Lord, but all the nations to the Lord, a remnant. That's why in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from where? Every nation. All tribes, all peoples, all languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They're clothed in white robes, palm branches in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice, Yeshua, salvation belongs to our God who is sitting on the throne and to the Lamb. And then in verse 13 and 14, look at this. This is mind-blowing. One of the elders addressed me saying, who are these? This is the same thing that Jacob said. Who are these? Clothed in white robes, where did they come from? And I said, sir, you know. And he said, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Wow, well, this shows us there are going to be some people going through the tribulation. And now look at Genesis 49, 1 and 2. 
Jacob calls his sons and said, gather yourselves together that I may tell you what's going to befall you in the end of days. Assemble yourselves and hear you, sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel, your father. Well, uh, here's the thing. Jacob knew that unlike the generations before him, because they were always fighting over who gets to be the one to inherit, now it's not one person going to inherit. It's all 12 tribes are going to inherit it, okay? Just like uh, Ishmael or Esau, one of them was disinherited, okay? But all 12 of his children will become co-heirs to the covenant of Abraham because all of them were to become one nation. Diverse, but that's the whole thing. God wants a cod like one, one not individual, but one whole nation. Also, interestingly, when the brothers report to Jacob that Joseph is alive, they don't reveal to Jacob in any way that they already knew that Joseph was kidnapped. Okay. Uh, also, when jo Jacob and Joseph do meet, it's interesting that this issue of how he got there was ever discussed. Nowhere in the Torah do we see they had a private conversation and, and Jacob asked Joseph, okay, how did you get here? Why did you leave me? You know, what? but the brother said you were killed. I don't, maybe he did tell them, but I think it's, the silence is deafening here in the Torah portion that Joseph never reveals to his dad who lived there for 17 years. Because can you imagine on Jacob's deathbed when he goes to bless the tribes? He doesn't, I mean, he's wailing on some of these kids, you know, but it's interesting. He never knew that Judah in particular was the one who wanted to sell him. Uh, so I find that quite interesting. Um, in Genesis 49, 10 and 11, oops, I got to get going. Uh, he says, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. That's a word for the Messiah. Uh, and uh, to him will be the gathering of the people, binding his donkey to the vine, his uh, donkey's colt to the choice vine. And then what does it say? He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. That's Revelation, guys. Look at Revelation 7, 13 through 15. And look how it ties to Genesis 49 about the Messiah. One of the elders answered and said to me, these, remember, he said, who are these? These are the ones who are arrayed in white robes. Who are they and what's come they? And I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are those who are coming out of the great tribulation. And then it says, they did wash their robes and they made their robes white in the blood of the lamb. Because of this, are they before the throne of God? They do service to him day and night in his sanctuary. And he was sitting upon the throne uh, show, and the throne will tabernacle over them. That's incredible. But look at Isaiah 63, one through four. Who is this that comes from Edom? That's Jordan, Saudi Arabia area. With the dyed garments from Botsra, who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why are you red in your apparel and your garments like him that treads in the wine fat? He says, I've trodden the wine press alone and of the people there was no one with me. I will tread them in my anger, trample them in my fury and their blood will be sprinkled on my garments. I will stain all my raiment for the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed is come. And then in Revelation 19, 14 and 15, it says the armies which are in heaven followed him on white horses, fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron as he treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of almighty God. So we see the blood of the grapes and we know that's the fall harvest, the grape harvest. And we know the whiteness refers to Yom Kippur. And then two more verses, Revelation 19, 14 to 15, the armies which are in heaven followed him on the white uh, horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. He'll smite the nations, rule them with all iron as he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. Genesis 50, 25, then Joseph takes an oath of the children of Israel. And he said, God will surely visit you. And I want you to carry up my bones from here. So just like his father, Jacob promised him, to get him out of there and give me to the promised land. Joseph does the same thing. And that's why when Moses leaves 215 years later or so, what does he do? He takes Joseph's bones. Now, get a load of this. They knew redemption had come when Joseph's tomb was empty because they picked up his bones. Well, guess what? When Messiah came, they knew redemption come, came because Joseph's of Arimathea's 
tomb was empty. So now what we're doing, we are closing the door to the book of Genesis. We're opening the door to the book of Exodus. Uh, and so now we see that the closing of one door to the book of Genesis and the birth of mankind opens the door to the Exodus and the creation and birth of Israel. Quite fascinating. You know what's interesting to me? That God wasn't content just having angels in heaven singing his praises. They, they were all there first. Even though he has all these beings singing his praises, he wasn't happy. He wanted men and women of flesh and blood with earthly passions, living physical lives. He wanted to have them live an upright life in a morally degenerate society. Okay, that is to validate and justify the whole idea of creation and the creator's decision to bring into existence mortal beings who were endowed with the freedom of choice, how they will live their lives. And so to me, it's, uh, I mean, this is one thing that just really shakes me to the core is God wanted free real beings who could be thrown into the mud and would choose to get out of the mud. They wouldn't enjoy the mud, you know, all the dirt. And you're going to see that more in the second half of what I'm teaching. But let's close with this. Let's all stand. Whenever we're closing one book and going to the next, uh, how many of you know we all need to be strengthened at this time? All right. Together. Kazak, Kazak, Vinit, Kazak. Be strong, be strong, and may we be strengthened. Avinu, Malkinu, our Father, King. I just pray right now you would strengthen and encourage everyone who is here locally, everyone watching across the United States, everyone who's watching across the world. Right now, we just pray a special blessing that each and every one of you individually will be strong, you'll be strengthened, and you will allow God to get you out of the quicksand. We're not saved if we're in the quicksand. You want to get us out of the quicksand. And so we thank you so much for bringing your salvation to giving us motivation to want to get out of the quicksand by feeling your heart that you loved us so much. You sent your only son to die, that you would be willing to die just so we could get out of the quicksand. May we yield to you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Okay. We're now in the section called Digging Deeper into the Gospels. We want to dig real deep. We don't want to just cover the surface. So let's look at Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. The book of the generations of Yeshua HaMashiach, the son of who? Doesn't say son of Joseph. Doesn't say son of Abraham. Doesn't say son of Adam. Son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, we know Abraham uh, wasn't the direct father of David, okay? But this is just giving you the highlight of the begats. And what's so amazing about this is that it says the son of David. Now, I've gone through this several times, so I won't go through the PowerPoints again. But the amazing thing is it talks about in here how it was 14 generations from here and 14 generations from here, if you remember. 14 generations from uh, Abraham, Okay, uh, and then you'll see the verse. I'm bringing it up in here in a minute. But David in Hebrew, numerically, is 14. And so when it says the son of David, the reason why it started there, because David's numerical value is 14. And then it goes 14 generations, 14 generations. It's trying to tell you this is the Messiah, the son of David. That was the point. But you don't see that in English. You only catch that if you understand the Hebrew. Okay. Now, do you remember Babylon destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, right? But God had made a promise to David about having a king on the throne forever. But now in Matthew 1, 
there hasn't been a Davidic king for 400 years. Now it's been 2,400 years, okay? So what's going on here? Well, let's look at Isaiah 11. There shall, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Well, do you know what this is saying? Here's an uh, ancient olive tree. And yet at the same time, there's these new branches that are springing out of this olive tree. And here it talks about um, a, the stump of Jesse, basically. So it's what that, when you see a stump, that means the tree's been what? Cut down. And that's what happened. He is prophesying about there not being a Davidic king for a while. And now look at this. Here the Messiah comes. Look at Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 8. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your fellows that are sitting before you, for they are men wondered at. And now look what it says. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. This is the branch that's coming out of the stump of Jesse. Okay, and then look at verse 12 and 13. And speak to him, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold the, what? Man. The man whose name is the branch, he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory. He will sit and rule upon his throne. He will be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Now, here's what's amazing, and this is where a lot of the Jews that are Orthodox fight over. This looks like it says, this is the guy that's supposed to build the temple. And now, if the Jews are trying to build the temple, some are saying, no, you're not supposed to build the temple. This guy's supposed to build the temple. But then the, the people that want the temple say, well, that's fine. He can, but until he does, we got to build the temple. You follow me? See, so they, they, they feel like they're close to the time when this is going to happen. So some say, why waste your time building it when he's going to build it in a few years? But they always say, yeah, but he wants us to build the temple. So we're going to build the temple. Now, when this is, when Matthew was written for the previous 200 years, the Hasmoneans Okay, and who were the Hasmoneans? They were Levites. They were Levites. They, and the king should not come from the tribe of Levi, it comes from the tribe of Judah, and yet Levites were sitting as kings. This was the big problem, is here you have someone who's playing both priest and king. That was only for one person, and that was this guy named the branch, because it says he'll build the temple and sit on his throne. Here is a guy who is both a priest and a king. Look at Psalms. Oh, do you remember even uh, Herod claimed to be king? Herod himself claimed to be king. In Psalm 89, verse three and four, it says, I have made a covenant with my chosen and I've sworn to David, my servant, your seed will I establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. So the Davidic king has to be reestablished. Look at what it says in verse 34 and 37. Look what God says. My covenant, I won't break it, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn it by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me, it will be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. I mean, you know, the moon's not going away until God says. The sun's not going away until God says. And the sun and the moon are faithful witnesses. This is why the eclipses are so significant. And when they fall, because they are God's faithful witnesses and no false prophet 
can manipulate an eclipse. Now, here's the thing. They're as faithful as the sun and the moon. Okay, now, I want to show you something. Here are the different stages of the moon. And how many moons are there going across in one row? Seven. And what, seven times four rows? 28. And how many days are in a month? <laughs> okay, but for, and the biblical calendar is right at 29. Okay, because it follows the moon. Now, with that said, listen to Matthew 1.17. All the generations from Abraham to David are how many generations? And from David to the carrying away into Babylon are? And from the carrying away of Babylon unto Messiah are how many? Okay. You have to understand the biblical calendar is based on the moons. So here we have. And I have Tevet 1 in the corner. This is not this year. It's a different year. But I want you to know something. How do you know when the first of the month is in the Bible? Boom! The new moon. Okay? And how do you know when there's a full moon or when it's the 15th? It's a full moon. And at the end, it's the waxing moon. The light is on this. Some people send me pictures of this is the new moon. Sorry, wrong side. The new moon is over on that side. You see what I'm saying? When the light is on this side, it's about to go into the new moon and start sliding over. Make sense? But let's look again at our calendar. I'm going to give this whole new perspective. Are you ready? For Abraham to David was 14 generations. That's 14 days. Each day was a generation. And then Solomon was the 15th, which is the full moon when Israel was in all of its glory. And then there was 14 generations from David to the destruction of the temple. Well, now Israel's all dark again. And then, guess what? Oops. Then, okay, uh, boom, What? Okay, let me go back one more. Oh, yeah, here it is. Okay, Abraham to David was 14 generations. David to destruction is 14 generations. And then what? From the destruction of the temple to Messiah. And Messiah is the light. So I want you to think of the days of the month as the generations also. Does that make sense? You following me? Okay, so where are we now? At the new moon, at the full moon, generationally, where are we on God's calendar? Think about that. Isn't this fun? Okay. Now, that sounds like me talking. How can that be? Okay. Look at Matthew 1, 21 through 23. Miriam will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, for he shall save his people from what? Here's the problem. Here we are. We're in our sins, and we want to be saved in our sins. We don't want to be saved from our sins. We love them too much. Just save me from the consequence. Don't save me from my sins, for heaven's sake. They're great. Just save me from the consequence. I want to be saved in my sins. I want to stay here. But it says he shall save his people from their sins, not in their sins. That's hard for people to grasp because we want to say the magic word, spin around three times, fall on the floor, and then now we're forgiven. We can sin all we want. We've got our free get out of hell free card. It doesn't work that way, guys. Okay. Now, Isaiah 7, 13 and 14. And he said, hear you now, O house of David, <clears throat> excuse me, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, this is in Isaiah 7, 
famous verse. Most of you probably know that. But in Judaism, there's a big argument over the word virgin, the Hebrew word that we're going to go into in just a little bit. Look at Matthew 2, 1 and 2. It says, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born the king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and are coming to worship him. Okay, so let's take a look here. Here we go. They see this star in the east and they come to worship him. And God said, there will be signs in the heavens. Okay, there is proof. Now, look at Genesis 1.14. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs. See, this is the problem with our Gregorian calendar is based only on the sun. So how can we try to work with the pagan Gregorian calendar with biblical holidays or biblical historical events? No, the pagan calendar we have to try to fit into the biblical calendar. You don't take something that is plumb and compare it to something that's out of plumb and try to figure it out. You have to take what's out of plumb and then try to see where it fits in what is plumb. I hope that makes sense. Okay, now, there is a very significant prophecy that clearly shows the two comings of the Messiah and it's in the book of Daniel, chapter 9. Let's look at Daniel 9, 24 through 26. Seventy weeks are decreed on your people and on your holy city to finish disobedience, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy, and then he says, know therefore and discern that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem to the anointed one or to the Messiah, the prince will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with the street and a moat, even in troubled times. And look at this. After the 62 weeks, the anointed one or the Messiah is going to die. He's going to be cut off. So right here, we plainly see the Messiah, the anointed one is going to come and he's going to be cut off. And then it says, and we'll have nothing. And the people of the prince, referring to Rome, will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will be with the flood. Even to the end shall be war. Desolations are determined. So what do we see here? The Hebrew word for anointed is Mashiach or Messiah. So we see the Messiah would come and die before the destruction of the temple. That's what it says in Daniel. So what do they do with that? The Messiah has to come twice and he has to be, he has to die before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Well, there's only one person who qualifies for that. Now, since the temple and city were destroyed in 70 AD, we know the Messiah had to be on the scene before that. Now, here comes the other big question that I hear all the time from many people. When it comes to whether a man can become God. I do not believe a man can become God, but I believe God can become a man. Big difference, big difference, a world of difference, as a matter of fact. We see in Genesis 18, 1, where the Lord appears to Abraham at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he washes his feet and he feeds him. Okay. In verse 3 and 4 of Genesis 18, Abraham says, my Lord, and it's the yud heh vav -Hey in Hebrew. It's not Elohim. It's the yud heh vav -Hey. He says, if I found favor in your sight, uh, don't leave, I pray you, from your servant, but let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and let me wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. For Abraham to say that, the Lord obviously had to manifest himself as a man. Abraham is talking to him face to face and he even has a long conversation with him. In verse 22, the other men leave and it says that Abraham stood yet before the yud heh vav -Hey and continues the conversation. God does manifest himself, his presence physically on earth whenever he wants. He manifested himself to Moses at the burning bush. 
And for Israel as a pillar of fire or a cloud, he manifested himself as the Shekinah over the tabernacle in the temple. In the Bible, it even says that Moses spoke to the Lord face to face as one speaks to a friend. And then in Judges 13, with the birth of Samson, Manoah and his wife see the Lord. Not only that, uh, here's a verse I added. I don't think it's on your notes, but I'm going to read it to you. This is one of my favorite verses showing how the Lord or God can appear as a man. This is Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 through 15. Joshua is about to attack Jericho. And Joshua lifts up his eyes and he looked and behold, it says, a man. A man was standing before him and he had a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or against us? And then it says, neither, uh, I'm the commander of the Lord's army. Oops. And he says, now have I come. And so Joshua, it says, falls on his face to the earth and worshiped him. And he said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your shoes for you're standing on holy ground. Shock and awe. Shock and awe. And so Joshua did. No, in Revelation, the angel says, don't worship me. I'm just like you. Here we see the commander of the Lord of hosts says, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground, just like with Moses. So we see he can appear as a man. Now, let's look at a bigger question. While the Lord may be able to manifest himself as a man, would he really ever want to become one? I know I wouldn't, <laughs> but let's look at the virgin birth in Isaiah chapter 7, 14. It talks about how the Lord himself will give a sign and a virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel or God with us. Now, in the Jewish virgin, a version, it doesn't say a virgin. In the JPS, it says a young woman. Okay, a young woman uh, instead of a virgin. Well, guess what the Hebrew word is? The Hebrew word is Alma. Uh, for those that want to write it down, it's the Ayin Lamed Mem Hey. And to this, Judaism says that it does not say virgin, but a young woman. And they said there's a better Hebrew word that really means virgin. Why did they use that? And that word is Batula. Okay, and Batula is a word which is used when it speaks of. Rebecca being chosen for Isaac as in Genesis, okay? So that means the Hebrew word for virgin, they say is Betula. Why didn't it say, why didn't it say Oma there? Okay, well, let me give you these scriptural examples. In Genesis 24, 16, it says, the damsel was very fair to look upon a virgin. Neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. So here, the Hebrew word is Betula. So they say the verse in Isaiah is mistranslated into the English. But here is the problem. Betula can refer to a woman who is not a virgin, even though, say, it only refers to virg uh, virgins. And guess what? An Alma, who means young girl, can refer to a virgin. And I have scripture proof for both of those. The first is in the example of the same story of Rebecca in verse 43. It says, behold, I stand by the fountain of water and let it come to pass when he says that the maiden that comes forth to draw to whom I shall say, give me, I pray thee, a little bit of water for a mere pitcher to drink. Okay, this is Eliezer asking the Lord. When he says maiden, the word is Betula. Wow. So if she's a virgin, she can also be the Betula. So they both can mean virgin. They both can mean young woman. Now, here the word for maiden is Alma, and we already noted she was a virgin. So an Alma could be a virgin. Okay, now for the word Betula. Betula does not always mean only virgin. Look at the book of Joel, chapter 1, verse 8. It says, lament like a virgin, gird of a sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Well, here the word is Betula, and it talks about a woman who's married. 
And so you can't say Alma only means young woman and Batula only means virgin because they both can mean both. You following? So here the word is Batula, but we know it doesn't refer to an actual virgin because she's mourning the death of her husband. So what gives us a clue to what the sages really thought that word virgin in Isaiah 7, 14 meant before Yeshua was even born? Well, one big clue is how they translated it into the Greek when the Septuagint was written over 200 years before the birth of Yeshua. And the Septuagint, or the 70 Jewish scholars, they all chose the Greek word parthenos, which definitely implies a virgin. A parthenos in the Greek, when they translated it from Hebrew into Greek, okay, they chose a Greek word which literally means virgin, not young woman. So when the Jews today say, well, it's uh, Betula and it can't be a virgin, well, then how come the 70 translators before Messiah came used a Greek word that means a virgin, not young woman? Okay. Now, etymologically, which means where words come from, the meaning of the word Alma is derived from the verb meaning to hide or to conceal, just like the womb conceals the baby, okay? You can't see the baby, but you know there's a baby there. The term Alma is never applied to a married woman. So what is absolutely incredible as shown in the Dead Sea Scrolls, do you see that word le mar be? Okay, listen to uh, this here in just a second. Uh, In the verse, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, this is the verse where it mentions that a child is born whose name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, you know, uh, the Mighty God. And it says, and how the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Well, there is an anomaly in the Hebrew you don't see in the English that is absolutely mind-blowing. Okay, here it is. This is Le Marbe. Now, do you see the second letter going this way is the M, the Mem? Now, oh, I should have had it in blue, but I want you to, it's not the best color. Here it is again, but do you notice how the Mem is closed at the bottom and this Mem is open at the bottom? Can you see the blue in back there? How the, the Mem changes shape? The way the Hebrew language works, the Mem is never, 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 never closed unless it's at the end of a word. But here it's closed at the beginning of a word. And that's how it was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls long before Messiah was born. So what's going on here is this. The sages say that an open mem versus a closed mem, always, uh, the letter mem always represents water. Mayim, water, okay? And so... They say that an open mem versus a closed mem also refers to an open womb versus a closed womb. Someone who is barren versus someone who can get pregnant. Okay, just like uh, the water breaks forth when a child is born. So a closed mem means barrenness. The rabbis taught that when it was time for the redemption, the closed mem of Isaiah's Le Marbe will open for the coming of the Messiah. This was taught to the Jews. Now, there is no doubt that Jewish leaders looked at this passage as a messianic passage with the expectation of some type of supernatural birth. So here we have the closed womb of the virgin being opened at the time of redemption. Now, what's important is In Isaiah, the Jews say that that refers to Hezekiah. Hezekiah is the one this is talking about. Well, not so. Uh, It says here uh, in the section of the Talmud known as Sanhedrin 94, the question was asked, why is the mem closed? And it states in that section that the Holy One wished to appoint Hezekiah as the Messiah But the attribute of justice says, if you did not make King David the Messiah, who uttered so many hymns and psalms before you will appoint, uh, before you, 
Will you appoint Hezekiah as the Messiah who did not write one hymn to you in spite of all the miracles you did for him? So they also claim that it could not have been referring to Hezekiah. So the main thing is, I do believe in a divine birth, but I believe that it is Yeshua who is deity in the flesh. That couldn't refer to Hezekiah. And they even, even though they say it refers to, in other places they say it can't be. Well, I don't know if you knew this about Hezekiah. Do you know who Hezekiah Remember, he, he's the one who begged for like 15 more years and the sand dial clock turned back 15 degrees. Do you know why God allowed him to live a few more years? He didn't have a child to take over the tribe of Judah as king. So God had to turn it back just so he could have a kid. So who did Hezekiah marry? He married Isaiah's daughter, Hephzibah. So here Hezekiah marries Isaiah's daughter, and guess who he has? What's the name of the child? Manasseh. Manasseh is the worst idol worshiper king of the entire Bible. Do you know in the book of Hebrews where it talks about the heroes of the faith? One of them talks about uh, they were even sawn in sunder. They were cut in half with a saw. Manasseh sawed his grandpa Isaiah in half. He is the one who did that. Yeah. I don't think Hezekiah is going to be the Messiah. Okay. But yeah, Manasseh was a monster. Okay. Let's go to Matthew 2. Verse 1 and 2. So Yeshua was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king. Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east, and we're come to worship him. Okay, so Herod wants to know, where is he? Where is he? And in Matthew 2, 5 and 6, they said unto him, He's in Bethlehem of Judea because it's written by the prophet, and you Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah. Out of you will come a governor that will rule my people Israel. Where does that come from? That comes from Micah 5 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you will come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth has been from old, from everlasting. That proves the divinity of the Messiah. But then look at Matthew 2 13 through 15. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. And he says, Arise, take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt and be there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And so when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, uh, of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. And that's found in Hosea 11.1, 1, when Israel was a child. Then I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. And so, like I was saying last week, everyone is arguing over who's the Messiah. You know, if Jesus or Yeshua is the Messiah. Well, he said he's supposed to be called out of Egypt. No, no, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. No, no, he's going to be called a Nazarene. They were all right. Okay, from different perspectives. Um, there's one more thing. I have a handout if you didn't get this by the notes. This is a very important handout because there are four Herods, four different Herods. And so I have here all of the Roman Caesars, like uh, Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, Caesar Augustus, Caesar Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero. All of these happened during the New Testament time period. And so I have uh, the Bible verses, which each one, so you know which Roman ruler uh, and you can find out when Pontius Pilate was there and uh, when it talks about Felix and Festus, I show you what time frame when all of these uh, people lived. And uh, I highly recommend this. It tells you who the Roman emperors were, Israel's rulers were, who the Roman procurators were, all from uh, 49 BC to 95 AD on this one sheet. You got everything. So when you're reading your Bible, you can connect who is who. All right? All right, let's stand. I hope this has been fun.
Avinu Mokeno, our Father King, I just thank you so, so much for everything you're doing in all of our lives. I just pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, that we would understand that you are a living God, that you are involved in this world, that you have the power to do whatever you want, whenever you want, and that we would just come and sit at your feet and learn from you. And we're so grateful that you love us so much that you would actually want to not only bless us, but put your name upon us. It's incredible. Even as you told Aaron to say, Ivarekika Adonai Vishmareka, Ya'er Adonai Panavileka Vihuneka. He saw Adonai Panavileka Vihasem Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in that most wonderful name. Ayah Asher Ayah. Amen. Be blessed. Get your notes over there.